Hi, and welcome to the meeting of the Rotary E-Club of District 7710 for Tuesday, June 9th, 2020. I'm Kathy Roadcup, president of the E-Club of District 7710. Thanks for joining us this evening. Our presentation this evening is the last session of the Red Seas program. Rotarian and E-Club past president, Eve Marion, uh, will be our speaker. Eve? Hi everyone, and thank you for being here. Uh, so I'm going to go over the rationale of Red Seas tonight. Um, so uh, talking about our club, our Rotary Club's Red Seas journey, and I've added a section at the end um, about my own journey. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the Red Seas and how Kevin and I started down this path over a year ago, and. And then, as I said, I'm going to transition to my own personal Red Seas journey and conclude with some recommendations, suggestions, offerings. Um, I will say that tonight I'll be speaking about race in terms of black and white people, but just know that I'm keenly aware of indigenous and people of color and that they're a key part of this story. And as I work to hone this talk, because I expect I will be continuing to do this a bit more um, I'll definitely do a better job of being more inclusive. And I'll also be centering my own experience tonight in the hope that it's helpful for other white people to hear my story. That's not to say it won't be instructional for everyone, but really um, this, the second part of my talk is largely aimed at um, encouraging white people to step up as allies. So we're gonna launch on the Red Seas program first. And so we all know the four-way test and that this is our universal rotary lens. We, um, we initially conceived of Red Seas as a new lens and a framework of tools to help us think more deeply about the development and impacts of our local rotary service projects. And so when Kevin and I um, started talking about this, we. We saw, you know, a curriculum in the making. We wanted to make sure we had readings. Uh, we were going to do a series of trainings um, with and for um, community stakeholders and Rotarians. We were looking at case studies um, and co-design projects in community with other people in, in the area. Um, and the money that we got was actually for not for any of this. <laughs> this was all in kind that we were trying to do it basically ourselves, a super ambitious project. And we, um, the funds we asked for were to um, have a platform for all of this. So we would do a series of trainings that people could take online and then get a certification from the e-club. And um, we were funded by Durham 150 um, and the district for this work. So our framework or lens was to look into race, equity, diversity, systems, environments, and sustainability as they relate to the design and execution of service projects and the four-way test. And so we had a lot of people ask us why do we need another lens and um, sorry, my dog's barking. <laughs> so, and we, we, we just asked ourselves whether we were truly using the four way test when we embarked on service projects, we were seeing and hearing some evidence of a gap. Um, we were hearing about racist comments on social media. We were hearing about paternalism, sexism, and a lack of awareness or understanding of community priorities from other Rotarians. So what we were aiming for in the Red Seas um, environment was a, judge a judgment-free zone. We um, wanted to start a conversation that would get us all thinking. We didn't have the answers. We just wanted to have the conversation and get moving. Um, we, were uh, we were really trying to build an understanding that Red Sea's concepts are intertwined and not discrete. Um, we also wanted to recognize that systems matter, even if you don't understand how they matter, they still matter. Um, we were building an awareness that impact often matters more than good intent, um, and to provide a safe space to be uncomfortable with being uncomfortable. 
And Kevin often says, it's not enough to bring everybody to the table. We are trying to bring the table to people to have them be part of the conversation. So the Red Seas acronym um, was Kevin's baby. <laughs> and I will say that lately it's taken on even more meaning, more personal meaning for me. Um, so I talked about this a few, I guess in March, I, we talked a little bit more about the acronym and the, the meaning of it. And so we did, we did go over the fact that, and I, and I wanted to say too, that I am not religious. So this was this meaning, this, the acronym, the symbolism, the metaphor was, um, all new to me. And I mean, I knew about Exodus, but I hadn't really explored it in depth, but to sum up when, when that, Exit, it comes from Exodus 14, 21, when then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground and the waters were a wall to them on their right and on their left. And as the Egyptians pursued and went, went after them into, into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and horsemen. So that piece of it, you know, we, we really looked into this as an examination of this exodus, the, the metaphor, um, and how um, that's, that's sort of holding truth for us right now in this moment in America, and how we're dealing with a lot of discomfort, and we're in the wilderness, we're, we're really struggling to find answers. Um, and so we have to sit with this for a while. And our hope is that by sitting with it and, and thinking about some of the issues that we're, we're talking about with the Red Seas training, that we will find further truth. So our journey so far, so far, as I said, we started a while ago, actually I say July to September, but it was before that when we actually started thinking about the program and planning with partners and looking at priorities. Um, in October, Alexandra Villaderas came and spoke with us. She is um, a local community advocate. Um, she just got elected to the school board in Durham County um, and she had lived in McDougal Terrace. So we, we started with this plan to bring people like Alexandra to the table and us to bring the table to Alexandra. Um, but along the way, we had some, some pretty serious hurdles. Um, and one of them, our key stakeholder group was the Durham Housing Authority. And we, um, as many of you know who live in Durham, they suffered a huge um, crisis brought on by carbon monoxide in the, in the housing um, complexes. So a lot of our work um, kind of trying to access key leaders and help work on this together kind of fell through. Um, so we spent several months seeking input from various community, community leaders with ties to D Durham Housing Authority. Um, and thankfully in January, we were able to bring a group of um, community health advocates called Fresh Life um, to speak to us about their smoking cessation work and some of their own priorities. Um, in March, we pivoted to regular meetings, um, and that's when I gave a fairly extensive talk about the breakdown of the Red Seas acronym and what that would mean in terms of developing curriculum and a toolkit. Um, so in April, we invited Heather Mounts from Duke to give a talk on design thinking, which was also a component um, to get people thinking about design thinking in, in um, collaboration with community partners to solve problems. We were planning to do an online community forum in May, um, but as, you know, if we back up, I think I gave my talk, the Red Seas acronym talk in March, and COVID was just starting to take over all of our lives. And thankfully for us, we're all already using a virtual platform, but we knew having the kind of online community forum that we wanted to have would be a real stretch for some of our community partners and collaborators. And then so tonight, um, I'm talking a little bit about wrap up and next steps. 
So these are the lessons we learned um, along the way. <laughs> we learned a lot of really great lessons, but a lot, a lot of hard lessons too. So um, we did not spend enough time talking with Durham Housing Authority and other community stakeholders. Um, so we would like to say, do as we say, not as we do. Uh, we underestimated how much time it would take to build the program together, and that's a lot longer than a year, although I think we've made amazing progress. Um, we had low buy-in from Rotarians, even with from within our own club, and it, we just felt like that was our fault for not doing a better job communicating. And also, it's not an easy thing to get people to jump on board with. So no one really wanted another meeting. So one of the, the key things we, we felt keenly was between the carbon monoxide crisis and obviously COVID-19, you can't put that river sometimes it's just gonna flow right over you and you just have to adapt um, some Rotarians just weren't ready for this and but we're hearing that many are and you know one of the things that I took to heart was the fact that you know it was this was a fairly political and I use air quotes here on purpose um, pro project or program um, and I definitely internalized some of the resistance to this message and was a bit discouraged along the way. I feel entirely different now <laughs> about this, um, thanks to some really amazing allies and champions. I know we weren't wrong and we have to keep going. So what, I'm not gonna dig too, too much into the curriculum, but I will say I think the racial equity impact assessment is like a really key tool to think about and as we equip ourselves with this lens that we're trying to create and um, I'll call out the fact that we're really good at identifying stakeholders and ensuring viability and sustainability and identifying success indicators but we are not great at engaging stakeholders or identifying and documenting racial inequities examining causes clarifying the purpose considering adverse impacts which is key um, advancing equitable impacts and examining alternatives of improvement. So this is a slide that some people have probably already seen in different phases along the way, but I just wanted to point out because it's, it bears repeating that equality does not equal equity. Um, if you look at this slide, you'll see that all of the, the platforms on the left hand side as people reach up for the apple are equal. However, if you look at the right side, you'll see what equity actually looks like. And sometimes you have to give people an extra few platforms to make them be able to reach the apple in the first place. And then taking it further as this has been evolving, um, fair with the equal platforms may not actually be just. So just is removing the fence. That's what justice looks like in this picture. So in April, um, and I talked about this because I had a bit of a heads up, I was happy to get the April um, uh, Rotarian the day I was giving my talk in March. And so Mariah um, Arcocha White, is from Toledo, Ohio, and she's the founder and CEO of Inclusivity LLC. Um, and she talks about leading with inclusion, because if you create an inclusive environment, then diversity will come. Um, if you're just focusing on diversity, you're focusing on checking boxes of people who are visibly different, and you'll never change the culture because you're not focusing on behavior. So diversity is a fact, inclusion is an act. And this this is just something we need to think about as Rotarians. It takes effort and practice. And then she, she ends with one sign of an inclusive culture is that people are listening for assumptions that reflect bias and they feel comfortable saying, why do you believe that's true? So some questions about how race, equity, diversity intersect with Rotary service. And these are things for us to keep in mind. Um, this is also part of the Red Seas paradigm so do we listen to hear and learn from experiences of stakeholders? What is normal to us is our bias showing. So basically what's normal is, is all of the 
baggage that you personally are carrying around what you perceive as normal. So who are we serving and why are we serving them? Who's at the table? And how do we know we're helping? And what stereotypes might we be unintentionally, unintentionally perpetuating? So looking at systems and environments, the reality um, is that we're dealing with a very unequal uh, set of, of spaces. So the factors that, uh, that are included in the environments are in which people are, people are born, live, work, and play. They're also known as the social determinants. These determinants substantially affect and shape health and quality of life for better or for worse. And you can think about food deserts, toxic housing, unsafe drinking water, access to health care, poor fetal and maternal health care. And these disproportionately impact people of color. We have to consider disproportionately the impacts, negative impacts of the following on um, black and indigenous people of color. And, and that's built including built environment, including in infrastructure, political systems, institutional systems, communities, um, where you live and why you live there, um, access to resources, transportation, air quality, water quality. And so something that I often hear in my work, and it's um, just looking at a system, the system that perpetuates inequity and inequality as a groundwater, and it's used as a metaphor to help practitioners at all levels internalize the reality that we live in a racially structured society, and that that is what causes racial inequity. And so the metaphor is based on three observations. It's racial inequity looks the same across systems. Socioeconomic difference does not explain inequity. And inequities are caused by systems, regardless of people's culture or behavior. So the, the metaphor for those of you who haven't heard is, you know, if you're thinking about a lake and you have one or two fish that are dying, you think, okay, those fish must be sick. There must be something wrong with those, those fish. If you have a couple of lakes and half the fish are dying, um, then you think, okay, maybe, maybe it's the water. But if you have hundreds of lakes and half the fish are dying, then you start to see maybe it's the groundwater. And so that's the analogy and the metaphor that's carried through the groundwater um, trainings of racial, um, the Racial Equity um, Institute. So, and I will say that global grants um, in terms of sustainability guidelines really offer some, some fair sense points. Um, start with the community, encourage local ownership, identify com key community members, provide training, buy local, find local funding, measure your success. These are all really great things to have um, in accompaniment with, with a racial equity analysis. So our original plan um, in terms of wrapping up this, this section of the talk was to create a Red Seas curriculum and a certification platform. Um, and after years of working and a year of working and organizing and learning, we knew we had some more work to do. So we were at that point now. So we, we actually were um, privileged to be able to donate all of our project funds to get to target hunger relief as a result of the pandemic. And we donated funding to our, our money to our, our Durham Housing Authority Foundation, uh, the partners that were involved in this work. We also donated to End Hunger Durham and Durham Public Schools Foundation. Um, so to continue, we'd like to raise, we'd like to continue to raise awareness of Red Seas and would like the club to consider uh, making racial equity a priority focus. Um, we'd like to advocate for change within Rotary and we're working on a dedicated section of the club's website to house Red Seas related resources. And we continue to need your, your input and feedback and just know that Rotary needs you. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my own journey. I moved to Durham in 1997, but I'm just gonna share um, a few points from my, my, 
my younger days, I'll call them. <laughs> so, um, so I was born in Toronto to two white baby boomers and we moved to Nova Scotia when I was four. And I've always thought of myself as not racist. And I'm using that term like in quotation marks here. Um, my godmother, very close, person in my life is Jamaican, as is her whole, like, I was, I just had regular contact with her whole family. Um, and we're, they are my family. So I felt like, you know, that was not a problem for me. And I always had at least one close friend who was black when I was very young. So when we moved to Nova Scotia, there were literally only two black families in an entire rural farming community. I, um, I talk about, I never knew that there was this, um, this settlement called Africville, about 90 mile, minutes away in the nearest big city of Halifax until I was in my 30s. Um, Halifax, Nova Scotia was founded in 1749, and that's when African people held as slaves, dug out roads, and built much of the city. And I just want to say, I work for the Halifax Chamber of Commerce, and I didn't know that then when I worked for them. I never heard about this. So the first official record of Africville is from 1761 when the land was granted to several white families, including families of men who imported and sold enslaved African American or African men and women. And in 1836, there was a road built that connected um, the main city to the, the area. So um, I just want to say quickly that the, the people who were inhabiting Africville were a mix of freed slaves, Maroons, and Black refugees from the War of 1812. And many of these refugees, and this is what really struck me, that were once enslaved, were from the Chesapeake Bay area of the U.S. In, in 1962, the city approved plans for an expressway into downtown Halifax, sounds familiar, um, that would run over Africville. But while everyone was evacuated, evicted, moved, homes were bulldozed, the highway was never built. So again, I just want to say I grew up 90 minutes away from this area. I never heard a thing. I didn't, I didn't know. So um, I didn't understand that Nova Scotia was the eastern end of the Underground Railroad until I came to America, which is still staggering to me. I was not even aware of really important change agents like Viola Desmond until recently. Um, in, in 1946, she, was, she refused to leave a section of a movie theater in New Glasgow, Nova, Nova Scotia that was for whites only. She was dragged out and thrown in jail. Um, and her activism is commemorated on, in, was commemorated in 2018 on Canada's first vertical banknote. But I will say um, in terms of desegregation, it was legally ended in Nova Scotia in 1954, in part because of the publicity generated by her case. And like several of you, I'm old enough to, to remember that my first experience really thinking about race came from a nursery rhyme, um, the nursery rhyme, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. And I just, I was told my, by my parents from a very young age that I wasn't allowed to say it the way the other kids said it. And that's all I'll say there. <laughs> so um, from Nova Scotia, I actually went to Kingston, Ontario and got my degree and my law, um, my legal assistant diploma. Um, I will say because I did women's studies that I learned from a, many black and brown and white women that the stories of women's lives were largely missing from the historical narratives. Um, I read a lot of Audre Lorde, Bell Hooks, Alice Walker, Zora Neale Hurston, and that was like in the early 90s. I was pretty aware of those authors and the work that they were doing. Now on the flip side, I was doing art history at the same time, I did a double major and not, I don't recall a single black, black artist being discussed in my whole degree. And I only learned about the Harlem Renaissance for the first time after I moved to North Carolina. So when I ended up doing my master's and studying the history of science at Duke, um, I don't recall ever reading anything by black scientists in the literature, even though they were, I worked side by side with them at Duke. And thankfully, I did learn something about black and African American scientists from my children who were educated in the Durham public schools. Um, and I put CJ Walker in there because my son had to do a project on, 
on her. <laughs> and he was not happy that he got stuck with writing about a black woman, but he still knows a heck of a lot about Madam C.J. Walker when a lot of people um, his age don't. So um, diversity and inclusion training. Again, I'm telling you this story not to make it about me. I'm just sharing this because I want to be honest about my own journey. It's not as simple as getting trained. And it takes time to assimilate that you're part of a racist system and therefore part of the problem. And I still often feel ill-equipped. If you look at this list of all of the things that I've been involved with um, in my adult life, um, I'm still confused and I still have a hard time. And I, I know I have a lot to learn. Um, I just want to point, point out that I did racial equity and inclusion training, um, the first phase in 2017. And it was incredibly challenging. Um, and there are things that I learned in 2017 that I'm just now really absorbing today. So the things that I've learned so far, um, and this is more part of my Durham Durham story um, since I moved here. Um, I don't have time to tell everything, but I just wanted to say that I'm an ally in development, a fledgling anti-racist, and no longer not a racist. I'm trying to balance the scale just a bit. Um, so I've learned that race, what racism looks and sounds like all of the trainings in the world may not show you a path forward until you're ready to see it. And I can speak to that. Um, for my work, I, I see every day how zip codes matter to a life expectancy. Um, racial equity and inclusion work can be incredibly difficult and uncomfortable, but also incredibly rewarding. Um, like I said, I know and understand very little. And I, I want to talk a little bit about the fact that if you're a good person, it doesn't make you not racist. Um, that's a hard one for people to hear. And I think we just have to sit with that. Having black friends does not make you an ally. And being woke doesn't make you an anti racist. And so I talked a little bit about that river that's carrying us before um, the one with the carbon monoxide, the the things that we had to adapt to and bend to and move move along. Um, and so whether we're ready or not, the river's carrying us. Um, and my last, my last sentence may sound a little harsh, but if we think about what people have been dealing with, people of color have been dealing with for centuries, we don't get to be tired as white people, but we do have to take good care of ourselves so that we can continue to fight for equity, equality, inclusion, and justice. And we need more white people to step up and speak out for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Amand Aubrey, and Tony McDade, and David McTee. So what can you do as a white ally and possibly a white anti-racist? You can sit with your own discomfort. I highly recommend that you take groundwater training, which is a three hour Racial Equity Institute training or the REI phase two train or phase one training, which is two days. Um, really understand American history and dig into systemic racism and ask questions. Question your beliefs. Read everything you can get your hands on. Um, Abraham Kendi has been in the news a lot lately and, and um, I will say that Brene Brown did an amazing interview with him. Um, if you wanna start there, that's a great place to start. Um, buy your books from Black-owned bookstores and not on Amazon if you can. And ask your library to order more copies. I plan to do that this week because it's ridiculous. The waiting list for some of these books is almost a year now, I think. Um, listen to New York Times podcast, the 1619 podcast, and then there are others as well. And probably a lot of you have heard them. Um, Snap Judgment, Code Switch, Reveal. Watch documentaries and movies. Um, just Mercy is actually streaming for free right now. Follow black artists and business owners and please credit them when you share. Shop at black owned businesses. Be honest with yourself and others about where you are, are on your journey and don't turn away from conversations about race because they're too political. 
So what can Rotary do? And I say this with love in my heart, we can stop tolerating racism, bias, and prejudice. It's not fair and it's not truthful and it does not build goodwill and better friendships. It is absolutely not beneficial to anyone, full stop. All district leaders, I think, should do racial equity and inclusion training with the REI Institute. They're right in our backyard, they're in Greensboro. They do amazing work. Uh, facilitate, tra sorry, facilitate trainings and discussions with RILA, Interact, Rotaract, and Rotary Clubs. And some of these conversations may be happening. I'm just not aware of them. Um, I don't want to discount the fact that people and, and clubs may be doing this work. I just don't know about it yet. Um, make REI training a foundation course in, within RLI. And it may be in development. It may be happening. I'm just not aware of it. Um, learn from the Peace Fellows because they really get this. They do this work every day. Um, and I, I will say that it would be good um, if we could advocate for um, looking at, a rate, at racial equity across all of our Rotary International's areas of focus. Because if you'll note, they align really well with some of the systems and, and the system, systemic inequities that we're seeing. Um, so the intention's there, but I think we have to take it further. And so I'll just say, we, we just have to do the work. This is not easy and we just have to do it. So thank you for being here tonight and listening. It's a lot to ponder and um, I absolutely welcome your feedback and questions. And Kevin and I would like to thank the E-Club and especially Rhonda and the pilot participants. Uh, Rhonda was just an amazing super champion for us. Durham 150, um, who knew we were gonna have this kind of year um, for the Durham, Durham's 150. Um, I actually was um, working last April downtown when we had the explosion on the day of the anniversary. Um, and so I feel like that, that, uh, that just changed a lot for me personally um, and for the whole city. I want to thank District 7710 and especially Joyce for helping us how to figure out to, how we could give some of our money away. Um, the Fresh Life Community Health Advisors, Alexandra, Dr. Laura Fish, Heather Mounts, um, at my colleagues at my work were amazing. And I thank Kevin and he thanks me. Um, and we both, <laughs> I had to put this in because we joke about this, but we both thank our family and friends for having to put up with us Scorpios. So I'll open it up to questions. Please feel free to unmute and ask any questions of Eve. Um, Eve, I just wanted to start by saying this is just such an outstanding body of work that you've put into this. And I really appreciate you sharing your journey um, and the Pro Red Seas program with everyone. So thank you. Eve, this is Doris, and I think this was really, really eye-opening. And what topped it off is that you shared your personal experience, and that's really important when you share in your personal uh, experience of the racial injustice. So that's really good. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Doris. I appreciate that. Eve, this is Rhonda. I just have to say phenomenal, phenomenal. The evolution of Eve Marion. <laughs> <laughs> of this Red Seas has just been amazing, amazing. I am so um, proud and just, this is like, to me, part of your thesis or something. This is really, like um, Kathy said, a body of work that you've done. I mean, the, the whole Red Seas program, just to, for some that may not have been aware, was not palatable to everyone. It, it, it was almost as if it came out of left field and everyone had to figure it out. And Eve had worked and worked and worked and worked to continue to bring it to us in a way that we could digest it. And um, she brought great people in that um, were able to actually demonstrate how Red Sea is so relevant to the community, actually more so maybe to them than to us. As Rotarians, Eve brought us along. <laughs> she kind of carried us through it to say, hey, this is worth um, 
how do you say it's, it's worth doing it's work worth doing and so um with the culmination of what just happened in our country the last week um the sensitivity levels have been so high that the amazing part of red seas is that it's now relevant <laughs> It's now profoundly understood that this is exactly what we were embarking on early, uh, in the last year. And um, I, I just love how you, you know, come full circle and that you were able to actually tell your story and um, your, your truth. I mean, it, it, I was saying this to several of my white friends that I am not going to beat you up because you didn't get it. <clears throat> because we all live our lives every day avoiding things, you know, things that hurt, things that are painful, things that are confusing, things that just, it's, it's a lot of work. We tend to avoid, you know, for me, weight loss or, you know, <laughs> on and on and on. We just don't want to do the work. And honestly, um, putting it off, putting it off, putting off doesn't make it go away. And in what happened to us as a society, it actually escalated to a point, it just boiled over. And of course, this is not the first time, um, but I think now is the time for us to take the challenge of doing the work. And the work, as I have to say, is on both sides. I think you brought that yeah. out very well that um, it, is, is, it is on both sides. It's the dialogue that needs to happen, the pain that needs to come out, but then the work of actually talking through it, understanding. Um, our white friends need to understand our perspective, but we kind of need to know why don't you get it? And mm -hmm. Eve demonstrated that so well. I mean, if your systems are set up in a way that you're not taught any of this, Mm. And you are going forward and you don't understand where your friends are and why they're not moving forward with you. You know, it's, it's so, what is it? Not discreet, but it's so, um, um, it's so much in the background that you can't really, it, you, it's not visible. It's just not visible. Mm. And so yet it's happening. You know, it's like one of those, it's, it's emotional scars really uh, uh, wounds and things that you don't see, but they're actually there, but no one else can see it. But when we saw the blood, when we saw the, the death, the lynching of George Floyd, then we could see it. But it, it's not just that, it's in corporate America, it's, it's everywhere and we don't get it. Um, some of us black people don't get it either. So you're not alone. <laughs> Um, some of it affects people more than others because of where their positions are. Meaning, if I grew up as a black person in a place of privilege, I may not get what my other black sister or brother may be feeling. So I too am a place of privilege. I too am not getting it. So anyway, with all that said, thank you, thank you, thank you. Job well done. <laughs> thank you, Rhonda. Thank you. I have a question, Eve. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I, I don't want to add to to, to your loading, but but you know, it, it, are you are you thinking of taking the show on the road, uh, uh, being available to other clubs uh, in terms of bringing the understanding and and you know, uh, doing something like this? Or would you be open? To it? I would be open to it. Um, the online platform is my comfort zone. <laughs> That's what it would be doing. Like for those of you, I I mean Kevin and Jeanne, and Rhonda, you probably know like how, I mean, I really struggle with public speaking. And when I started in the e-club and I was asked to introduce speakers, I was shaking in my boots. So my, I've come a long way from like that five years ago when we founded this club. And really it's a credit to Rotary in a lot of ways. Cause I, I just wouldn't have done it. Like I wouldn't have done it. So yes, yeah, Shafi, I'm willing, but it, I'm really nervous about doing that. So, Shafi, if you could, we record this, and if you could share it with as many as you can, um, it's on our YouTube channel. We'll make sure you get the link, and you just send it out. I think um, that would help, and you can set up, you know, any scenario, like she said, digitally that's needed. 
Yeah, yeah. But you know, I, I, one of the things is that, that and, I, and I always say that, you know, Rotarians are, 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 are you know, uh, innately lazy. Uh, <laughs> they will not go out there and, and do a training uh, if it's available there online. Uh, now, but if they are a captive audience in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, being at a Rotary meeting, and these days there are Zoom meetings, and so it would be something that you know, if if we could do this in a Zoom meeting, um, I, you know, we could in, if we can influence just one person, that's mm -hmm. one more person. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm not saying I wouldn't do it in person. It's just. I'm going to practice it this way for a little while. <laughs> I, I think it's great. I, mean, you know, I don't think the Zoom meetings are going away until the end of the year anyway. Mm, I agree. So, I mean, we, we, have, we have plenty of time. And so it's just something that I don't know if you've talked to, to, to Marie, but uh, I certainly would, would, would suggest to my club. Uh, and we, you know, we're, we're always looking for, looking for uh, uh, you know, good speakers and you know, and, and uh, it's time. I mean, this this is this is a great time. With the awareness is out there, where where you know, uh, I don't think people would be. Uh, I would say if this was like six months ago, people would feel uncomfortable. Yeah. I, I don't think that people would feel uh, that uncomfortable right now, bringing this up. Uh, and some, you, who knows, some people might learn something. Yeah. yeah. And I and Eve, I want to thank you and commend the e-club for supporting you uh, in this effort because it is really, really important. Yeah. And I think we've all come to realize that uh, with the events that have taken place here Absolutely. recently. And I want to share with you a comment um, on Instagram that my daughter uh, put out. Uh, she has a, uh, a very good friend who was a coach uh, for her at NC State and um, and happens to be uh, African-American, great guy. And he put out something saying that he understands the needs for demonstrations and uh, he applauds the people that are standing up and everything. He went on with the thing. And, and what Sarah said at the, um, on her post was, wise words from a dear friend Thanks for sharing this post. We all live in a world house, interconnected. If we don't see each other as family, we will perish together as fools. Mm. Wow. And I think, um, sorry, <laughs> that's the mom in me. Uh, but I think, you know, young people, we're, I mean, she just turned 40, but you know, that age group that some of you are and, and, uh, and, and her, I think, that's where we're going to make the strides right. is because we need to have those conversations and you need to bring the rest of us along and um and and we just need to have these conversations and move forward and i think uh marie's uh district governor marie's initiatives that she's working on um will be i think just so changing mm -hmm. um for the world and i think we need to consider to be on the speakers bureau just so you know, Mary, Mary um, Marie did put Red Seas and Eve on the listing. So, oh, good. like her f future things, she put, right. I think, some of the things that are already established. And then she said, you know, for additional things, and she put her out there. But then she also posted this meeting tonight on the um, district calendar. So, Shafi, I just think you and Marie would be great proponents to continue to share the recording and, um, you know, let, let everyone know. I think, like you said, this is a time for self-reflection, and I think right. whether people want to do it by themselves, you know, I have colleagues that told me, Rhonda, I couldn't even have a conversation with you for two weeks until I got myself, I mean, for a week, I, I until I got myself to talk to myself about this I had to first you know have that mirror moment and yeah. then I could even you know I was embarrassed to come to talk to you so I get it this is layers this is like an onion so it is. It I, is. I think the recording is going to help open the door for the conversation it would be and, and I think one of the things is that you know I mean 
people, as, as, as much as people might want to bring up this subject, they don't because they, they say, well, I, I don't know the audience. Now, uh, you know, but, but if, if they start discussing it, it's like, it's like a tumbleweed. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll bring other people together. And you know, I think it's just that, not that people want to be, uh, but they, they, they want to know that it's okay. Yeah. And I think this is what this brings out is for people to say, hey, it's okay to discuss this. Uh, because, you know, I, there was time when, when people didn't want to discuss it. Right. I will say, um, so something I skipped over, I, I didn't really mean to, but there's been a lot of talk about separate caucus discussions, like ra racially segregated caucuses that actually is beneficial to people. Yeah. Um, to talk in their, you know, to talk white people talking with black, white people, black people talking with black people. And I think that was the one of the things that I really struggled with when I did REI training. I didn't, I just didn't get it. Like I was just yeah. like, we've done all this work to, to bring us together. Now I see, like I see it now. I understand why it's important. Um, and I'm a big advocate for that. But I think it's unfair to be like, okay, everybody, we're doing this. You can't do it without like some kind of lead up and some kind yeah. of yeah. raising awareness of why it's important. <laughs> so, and like just slamming people into it doesn't make sense, so. Well, and that could be, that could be uh, the direction of your uh, pr program for Rotary. It's like, because obviously we've been on for an hour and that's not going to fly, even in no, no, even no. in virtual meetings. So if it could be if it could be yep. condensed, and and um, and then what what happens is there would be possibly that hunger to know more, and then that's where uh, we'd be able to get more information through the various resources that you mentioned. But to to kind of distill it down um, to to whet the appetite. And to get people to say, wow, I need to know more about this. And where do I go? Yeah. Really good. What, what I would like to sorry, sorry, go ahead. Nope. Oh, I just okay. said just a thought. <laughs> I was saying good feedback. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, what I would like to see is really, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, that Rotary really get involved in this. It absolutely get involved in this because, you know, we, we have the platform. We have the people. We have... You know, we don't have as much diversity as we would like to. Uh, but again, it's one of the things is this may be one thing that is keeping diversity from coming and becoming part of Rotary. And, you know, my team was EGAD. And it's like, I mean, I've, I've always believed in EGAD, which for some people that were not there during my year was, you know, uh, it, it's ethnic, gender, and, you know, and age diversity. We really need that in Rotary. And Rotary has lacked that. Somebody has said that, you know, somebody, somebody said uh, uh, that, uh, you know, that the trouble with Rotary is Rotary is too male, pale and stale. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, you know, <laughs> but, I mean, it's not, it's not in India, but in India also, hey, <laughs> there, there are, there is a bias. Mm -hmm. it, there's more of a bias in India than there is any place else. There's more of a bias in Pakistan than there is. I mean, I wouldn't, I, I, I people like myself, in, in Pakistan, would not eat a meal uh, with 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 the helper with 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 help. I mean, so so there are definite biases there, and and I think something like this could actually become mm -hmm. universal, and it could help Rotary, you know, become really truly a champion of change. Yeah, yeah, it's very good, Chef. Wish Kevin was on. He was supposed to be. He said he was going to join us tonight, but I don't know. He's got five kids and <laughs> things happen. Yeah. 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 Well, Eve, I'd love it if you could unshare your screen. I could share my screen. Are you already unshared? Oh, I think I'm unshared. Yes. Yeah. She's unshared. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. You give me one second. And Eve, uh, I know Kevin couldn't be here this evening, but no words can thank you. <laughs> None. This has been, um, you've done such an outstanding job. And I just wanted to thank you and present, um, sorry guys. Is that you? 
thought there, <laughs> I thought there was something I'm on my screen. Not cooperating this evening, everyone. <laughs> Um, common theme, I guess. Uh, but Eve, I'd like to present this certificate of appreciation to you and Kevin for imparting valuable insights and inspiration, um, not just as our guest speaker, but as our, our, our leaders in our club. And I'm very, very, I've told you before, but I'm so proud of you um, both for this program and uh, really wanted to just say thank you. Um, tonight, I've asked Doris Wallace, our president-elect, soon to be our president, um, of the next Rotary year to read our four-way test this evening. Doris? The four-way tests are the things we think they are due. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Fourth, will it be beneficial? to all concerned. Thank you, Doris. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. We are going to stop um, recording and uh, I would